Hey everybody, it's Joe DeGanzik with Smarter Home Life and a different kind of episode this time. A little bit of a serious topic uh, that you may have heard about in the news, uh, especially on the IoT and connected devices and home automation front. Um, I wanted to do this episode. It's gonna be a little bit impromptu, maybe a little bit lengthy, kind of closer to our Q&A episode, so just be aware of that. And uh, it is about 7.45 or so on uh, Sunday the 23rd of October. Um, Two days ago, there was a very large internet attack that occurred against DYN, or it's probably pronounced Dyn for, you know, short for dynamic, uh, dynamic DNS. Uh, many attacks in the past have occurred on or at various services or systems or whatnot. This was not the first, but a very large attack on part of the internet infrastructure. DYN is a DNS company. They simply um, are part of the internet infrastructure that translates names to numbers. Back in the early days of the internet, everything was an IP address, a num numerical address, and if you didn't know it, you couldn't go anywhere. But that wasn't going to hold up and do well for mass adoption. So DNS allows us to type in google.com and get to the ad that address. It also allows um, websites to change IPs and not change names. and that Kind of makes that an easier process. So because the DNS service was down, computers couldn't translate to the numbers to figure out where to go, so therefore it appeared that the services such as Twitter, Spotify, uh, Netflix were down when really they were just inaccessible. And you could change your DNS entry to something else, but most people don't know how to do that. So. The other part of this episode, uh, aside from sort of reporting on that, which has now been widely reported, um, is that I don't want any of this information to scare you. I just want to give you the information and give you the best tips on how to use it. So on Friday, we knew that this attack was occurring. It occurred. It was eventually filtered out, and uh, they took care of it. We didn't know where it came from. Uh, we still don't really know where it came from, absolutely, but we know that it was a, a botnet, sounds really scary, right? A digital army of connected devices, right? Now, they didn't say any brands, so I'm gonna hold this up, but I'm not gonna assume, we're not assuming it came from something like a Nest, but connected thermostats, DVRs, baby monitors, webcams, all of these things, could have been um, used in the attack. And that, those were the categories that were um, talked about in the various news um, articles that I was looking at earlier today, Financial Times and uh, Fast Company and so forth widely reported on this. So I have to my left a bunch of Internet of Things devices, none of which are specifically culpable or, uh, or were specified that they were part of the attack. Um, but, and it doesn't mean that they couldn't be used in the future. but let's get kind of to the meat of the story. So it used to be, you know, you used to hear about malware and PCs being used as big networked, you know, botnets um, to attack various um, services or people or whatnot. And that's hasn't gone away entirely, but the, the software, security software has gotten better so that less and less people have um, Windows 98 running um, and and have an operating system running that is much more vulnerable and don't have any kind of um, security software to protect them. So less of an issue, not completely solved at this point. But now we have all these devices, including things like iPhones and Android devices. Android is generally thought of as to be a little bit less secure or at least a more open playground than, the, um, than a non-jailbroken iOS device. Um, but whatever camp you're in, you know, you have to take your own precautions to make sure that you don't become uh, a victim of some sort of hacking incident. And obviously through a lot of the WikiLeaks uh, releases over the years uh, and Edward Snowden, we know that there's, there's ways of anyone can get into any device. And let me say that because we have to sort of say that as a, a general kind of disclaimer. Anything, almost anything that you connect to the internet is generally thought of as being vulnerable to some sort of access, whether someone's going to access it to just say hello to the device, or they're going to try to gain access to it for some malicious purpose. If you physically connect it to a network or wirelessly connected to a network and that's connected to the internet, it's potentially vulnerable. So let's just say that. So if you use good security, 
practices, it doesn't mean that you're completely safe. It just means you're safer, right? Okay. So uh, moving on, there were a lot of warnings over the years from researchers. They said all of these new Internet of Things devices are proliferating. You know, they're they're growing like triples from Star Trek, right? And they're going to be used in attacks in the future. Now we've had our first major one. Are there going to be more of them in the future? Probably. If I said there weren't going to be, everyone would point fingers and said, well, Joe from Smarter Home Life said there weren't going to be any more attacks. And therefore, uh, and he was wrong and we don't trust him anymore. So I'm going to say, yes, there's going to be more attacks. Uh, they will probably get worse and then things will get better. But we have a huge amount of IoT devices, right? We have a huge amount of things like connected you know, webcams, uh, baby monitors, uh, DVRs, I may have repeated that, categories of things that were used in this attack. Um, many of those devices don't have passwords. They don't have, um, uh, they may or may not get software updates. They may or may not be configurable. Um, and you may or may not know the company who made them. Um, that's the other challenge with technology today. It, it's not, it's not, I don't want to say it's easy because it's not easy to make technology, but it's easier for uh, many different companies, especially overseas, to make less expensive devices that look and operate like the ones that we um, we know and, and love from major manufacturers. And people naturally will be um, looking for great deals like coming up on Black Friday um, and the holiday shopping season. And they'll say, oh, I can buy this for 20 bucks instead of 40 bucks. I'll get that. It just may be that you have sort of a an open door on that device for people to get in and to get software on there to attack other things. And you may wonder why um, wireless devices like Android devices and uh, iPhones and so forth haven't been used in more of these attacks. Part of the reason is, is you, know, you don't know what the battery life is going to be. You could use it, they could use it for five minutes and just kill the battery potentially with a huge amount of traffic and you never know if they're actually online uh, or offline. Things that are actually physically connected or connected to Wi-Fi um, are going to be a little more um, readily available. And also um, there are generally, I'm not gonna say none, but there are less bandwidth caps and limits on a broadband connection than something like on a wireless data plan. So there's that, but that could change in the future. So um, all of this kind of lends itself to just saying, let's talk about security passwords, updates, and so forth. Because I just talked about devices that don't get updates. You have no idea who made them or where they came from. And that's, that also kind of leads me to another point that I don't review every product. I get manufacturers emailing me every week, and thank you manufacturers for reaching out to us, um, that they want their products on the show. Um, they'll send it to us and we'll review it and you know we'll get it for free and so forth. Uh, we have to disclose all those kind of things uh, and we do. But um, I don't review everything because I don't want to be known as the guy who reviewed this thing, recommended the product to you, and then your product was hacked in, in a big you know, uh, you know, um, thing that happened like on Friday and then you're going to come back and say, well, you recommended this and I'd be like, well, sorry, yeah, I'll return it or whatever. So I don't want to be involved in that kind of thing. And sometimes I just don't think that these brands are going to be well known enough um, or of the public interest to uh, to get enough traffic because part of this is that it's great to actually have um, a large amount of views on these videos. Therefore, it kind of helps the show financially and kind of like the circle of life on YouTube. But before I get into too much of that, let's talk about the major brands that we've featured on the show. Things like Nest, Philips Lighting, LifeX. Uh, we've talked about, um, uh, we haven't yet reviewed, but we will be um, talking about iDevices. We've reviewed um, uh, Zuli and so forth and other brands of devices that do get updates. They are from well-known brands um, that they have a team of people working on security things. Does it mean that the devices that are from well-known brands are perfect? Nope. But it just means that they are a little bit safer because at least someone is thinking about it and they're issuing updates and um, and there's that. So let's talk about the the thing that is most vulnerable, which is your network, and it's the gate, right? The gatekeeper of your network is your router. Your, whether it's Wi-Fi or traditional, I don't know who doesn't have Wi-Fi these days, but if you do, great. Um, for Wi-Fi specifically, 
don't use the use, don't use the default network name like Netgear or something like that. Newer routers are better at saying change it to something else. You know, and don't think that also just because you change it to something catchy like pumpkin spice latte, um, that no one's going to attack it if you have a bad password or a weak password. Change the password. Um, on a regular basis, generally you should change passwords to everything about every six months. I know it's an undertaking and it's difficult, but I'll get to that a little bit uh, in a little bit to make that a little bit easier on you. Um, so your router, disable access if somehow it's turned on for remote access to the settings of the router. That means from outside of your network, outside of your home or business. Turn it off if you don't really need it. Um, change if if there are different passwords change the access password for the settings of the router and change the um, Wi-Fi password on a regular basis every six months is a good rule of thumb and if you've never heard of the company who makes it if they don't make updates for it available if it hasn't been updated in five years if it's from 2002 maybe it's time to replace it and you'll get better, um, you'll probably get better uh, throughput on your network connection anyways. And it doesn't matter what you're connected to, satellite, DSL, um, cable, it's your broadband internet connection. Um, even if it's connected to a modem and you're online, you're still vulnerable. So that's your gatekeeper, secure the gatekeeper. I happen to use an Apple Airport Extreme. It gets updates on a regular basis. It's It has secure password on it. Um, it does have a catchy network name and you've seen it on the show, but anyways, you'd have to be within range to find out and to attack uh, and to, to be attacked. That doesn't always happen unless someone is just fishing your neighborhood for Wi-Fi for Wi-Fi that is vulnerable, which some people do. So just be aware of that, too. Um, so passwords, change them every six months across everything, all of your services, all, all your, your Facebook, your email. Uh, some people say to go with the bigger email providers like Gmail instead of something such as uh, smaller, lesser known providers, because again, they could be targets. I guess maybe they don't have the resources to keep up. But again, passwords, passwords, passwords. And usernames are important as well. Maybe don't use your first initial last name. Maybe don't use your common email address because those are the things that are generally stored in uh, and are dumped out by those big um, breaches of um, providers and you know WikiLeaks post big massive password dumps and so forth. Um, and then and then you're known and then you're a known thing and you could be accessed so that's again why it's important to change your password every six months even if it's a secure password so let's get to that a couple years ago after listening to uh, leo laporte talk about it uh incessantly on uh the various shows on the twit network twit.tv is another great source of general tech news they have like a zillion shows and they were part of the inspiration to launch this channel so thanks guys if you're if someone over there is watching it um LastPass, I finally converted to after Leo was talking about it for years. There are multiple password managers out there. Um, they're, in general, I'll say this in general, very secure. Nothing is perfectly secure. You know, let's just say that nothing is perfectly secure, okay? Um, but they're very, very, very secure. And if you use a strong, if you use a good username and a very strong password, then your vault of information is going to be secure. It's not perfect, but it's really, really secure. I love it. If it's one thing that we joke about, that I joke about on this show, that you know these devices can like alleviate your stress and reduce your blood pressure and so forth, LastPass is great. You don't have to worry about your passwords anymore. They're all in the vault. They can, and you can get access to them wherever you are. It's 100% free for desktops, you know, PCs and Macs, um, and for mobile devices, it costs a whopping, unaffordable. $12 a year, which is the same amount of money that I ask on a regular basis for people to donate to us to keep this show going and kind of, you know, free and independent of, of having to go seek like gigantic sponsorship opportunities and for me to, to make this a full-time job. So more on that later, but last pass, last pass, last pass. Um, if you want just a suggestion for a password manager, if you've heard of others and you already use one, fantastic. Absolutely fantastic, uh, but I use LastPass. I'm not being paid to say this. I just think it's great. Um, it allows you, again, not just to store them, but it generates them for you automatically. When I'm talking about good security, 12 characters, including upper and lowercase letters, numbers, and symbols. And use the 
most secure password that something will allow you to use. Some websites and some devices and services don't let you use certain characters. They don't let you go past a certain amount of uh, amount of characters for the length of the password. So use at least 12 if you can and longer up to about 16. Most of us are really not going to be the subject of a direct um, uh, attack in terms of a um, I can't think of it at this point, a brute force attack where someone is just guessing passwords constantly. Um, so in general, 12 to 16 characters is good, 12 is good. Um, so there's that two-factor, you hear about it a lot of times, um, two-factor as there are more of these lists that are dumped out that can affect not just online services, but when online services such as Amazon are tied into Internet of Things devices such as the Amazon Echo, and when the Amazon Echo is then connected to other things in your home, then you have a problem. So two-factor authentication just makes it a little bit harder for someone to get access to your account because generally it means that you have to give another factor of authentication in addition to your username and password, which of course would be stored in LastPass. LastPass itself has two-factor so that when you get in and log into your account in LastPass, you've got to authenticate yourself as well. And if you're thinking, wow, this is just way too much information, this is way too much security, there's levels. Start with changing your passwords every six months. Start with using a last, um, something like a LastPass or a 1Password. Um, start with something small and then add to it um, at your comfort level. Two-factor is something that is helpful for you um, to not get potentially um, attacked. And also, Think about your emails. You know, don't fall for the email scams. Don't click on links. I, I, I don't want to make this a general security episode, but there's these things that I just want to bring up just so that you're aware of these things. And, and you hate to hear of people who've just been lost to access to their account, clicked on the wrong link and so forth, but it happens. So just try to make so that it doesn't happen to you. I don't play a lot of the games and so forth on all the social sites, so I feel like I'm a little bit less of a target of these things. Um, so um, again, you may not think that you're a target like of a brute force attack, someone just guessing your password, but um, because there are ways of scanning for these devices um, that maintain connections outbound to the internet so that you can access them, again, like the Nest thermostat, um, it means that someone can find that, that you have such a device. Then they're gonna probe it further to find out well, how vulnerable is it? Is it, uh, is it vulnerable to a certain attack? Um, it, is there a password on it? Is it, good? is it a good one? Does it match a list of known passwords? They're gonna run through all these permutations. So the, the better that you can make your security uh, with a good strong password, a good username, and making sure the device stays updated, you know, the better for you. Does it absolutely mean that you're safe? As I said in the beginning, no, but it does mean that you're less vulnerable. Let's just talk about devices briefly. Let's talk about a device that, unless I'm incorrect, and please correct me, community, if I'm speaking wrong on this, because I'm, I like to think of myself as almost an Insteon expert, especially because I've been using it for so long. This is an Insteon on-off device. If this is connected to the internet via the Insteon hub or something else, like the software that I have running on the Mac, Indigo, which is connected to the internet, but is using strong security, um, and a strong password and a, and, a, and a username that's not known to any list out there and it's not it's not a usual, usual username that I use either. Um, if this was connected to something that generated a lot of heat or used up a lot of power and it was turned on by a malicious person out there, then I'm paying a lot for my power bill or my place could burn down because, you know, what if that thing that turns on and it generates a lot of heat falls down or it's next to some sort of um, cloth or a couch or a, a carpet, something like that that it could start a fire. That's where this stuff starts to get scary. But by itself, Insteon is not connected to the network. In fact, you can create an entire home automation network of Insteon devices with no hub at all. It would be a little bit difficult to do that, but you can do it. And you can also have an Insteon hub and cut it off from the internet. You don't have to have it on the internet necessarily, or you can have a controller that doesn't sit on the internet. That's also possible if you don't want that access. Um, there's multiple ways of securing that stuff. We'll go into it in other episodes because I don't want to make this episode a half an hour long. So 
that's just something to think of. This is a device that doesn't speak to the internet, but it needs a hub to get it access to the internet. Again, if that hub and that account that connects it to the internet is not secure, it's vulnerable, the hub hasn't been updated in months or years, then you have a potential problem. Same thing with um, Philips Hue lighting. We talk a lot about Philips Hue stuff, especially recently, including just yesterday. Was it just yesterday, I feel like? The little, um, uh, tiny little very <laughs> that goes that travels apparently um, the little uh, hue motion sensor they someone potentially I guess this is not connected to the internet it's connected via Zigbee to your Philips hue bridge but somehow what if someone found a way to get through and reprogram it to not sense your motion or to do the opposite of something you know, probably not going to do much with lighting because this you know the low energy lighting these days really doesn't do much it doesn't get that hot so probably not a big problem but still you don't want people doing stuff to your devices that they shouldn't be doing so again Philips Hue um, it's regularly updated it's updated actually very often I feel like it's the bridge software gets updated once a week sometimes um, Philips is a known brand they've been around for a very long time Nest now owned by Google Amazon um, one uh, light that we reviewed last year just because I thought it was cool and it might be actually in of interest to the to the uh, viewers of the channel was Revagi, um, a company from overseas, not well known, but they do, make, they do make some good products. This is Bluetooth only and it only connects to your phone. You can't connect it to anything else at this point. Um, is it 100% safe? No, but it's less of a target. It's less, it's more difficult to do something and reprogram this because they have to get into your phone first and then get access to Bluetooth and right now there's no power either. So not completely invulnerable but anything, like I said, anything connected to the internet could be, could be accessed and possibly vulnerable. Something else that's really vulnerable, right? I have a smart, I have the August smart lock. I have it connected to the internet via the August Connect. Now, has someone maliciously opened my door? It would be funny if it actually did on the show, but anyways, I'm sure it'll happen once I upload this episode. Someone will be like, I found you. Um, it's connected to the internet. It's secured with a strong password and a user and a good username um, that is changed on a regular basis. The lock itself is Bluetooth only, not impossible to hack, but not directly connected to the internet. Let's just say that. Is there a theme here? Change your passwords every six months. Use a password manager. Use two-factor two authentication, if possible, on various sites. Um, secure your, your desktops, you know. Macs and PCs can still be vulnerable. As vulnerable? No. Um, uh, perhaps in the modern uh, era with modern operating systems, but still use a good password, use security. Don't click on ridiculous links, don't go to weird websites download down download apps like crazy on on uh, android and other devices that don't have um uh kind of a built-in sort of firewall um like uh, apple does even though apple's uh app store is not perfect either even though i kind of world live in the mac world and the, the ios world it's not a perfect world either so uh, there have been more um vulnerabilities found uh recently so um I could keep going on, but it, the, the episode would be an hour long and I don't want it to be. Security, security, security. Not to scare you, just take the time and look at devices and find out if they can be updated before you even buy them. And take an inventory of what you have in your home right now. And can it be updated? When was the last time it was updated? Is it capable of having a password or is it just reliant on just being on your network and having a password tied in to some account like um, like a pass-through type thing like like August. The device doesn't have a password but the service has a password and the service can't get to the device without the password. You know what I mean. Um, that's all I'm going to say uh, because we're running out of time I think. Um, to keep this episode short. Um, if you like this type of content, if you've made it through all the way through, congratulations. Um, please give it a thumbs up on YouTube. That tells YouTube that it's a good piece of content and it should be kind of lifted upward uh, in terms of rankings. Um, subscribe if you're new to Smarter Home Life. Welcome aboard. Um, I like to do these episodes as well. They're a little bit longer winded than the more produced episodes, um, but um, 
I like to get this information out on a timely manner. So welcome to the Smarter Home Life family. If you love this kind of thing, you want um, you literally want this to continue for a long time to come uh, and help this become a truly um, full-time career for me personally. I hate to say it, you know, supporting me, um, but the show does help to support me, literally. I this is part of how I make a living. So Patreon uh, helps us do that, um, helps the show out by you contributing directly. At You can start at $1 a month, and if we had 10 to 15% 10 to of the entire subscriber base do that, it would be awesome, awesome, awesome. As we're going into the holiday season, add us to your list. That's all I ask, $1 a month, or the same as LastPass for the mobile devices, 12 bucks a year, pretty awesome. Uh, and there's rewards and stuff if you donate more. Patreon.com slash Smarter Home Life. Questions at SmarterHomeLife.com. Uh, the best ones get featured on the Q&A episodes. Otherwise, they generally get answered within a few days um, so I can get back to you or put in a comment below on this video. That's it. I'm sure we'll, I'm sure we'll be talking about this in a Q&A episode coming up. Thanks for watching and getting through the entire episode. I'm Joe Deganzik. Make your home a little bit smarter and a little bit more secure every single day. See you next time.